And as for Britain particularly, do you think there is a strange, you know, people talk a lot about the special relationship and so on, but do you think that's a case of Britain as formerly a great world empire that knows its decline, speaking to America in some very strange ways, to an America that sense it's on the precipice of decline? There is a way in which sort of the baton is kind of transferred almost gradually in things like the Pilgrim Society and like the relationship between the CFR and Chatham House. Yes. And you have a sense or the relationship between, do you know the name William Stevenson, the yes. quiet Canadian? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, who ran British security coordination during the war, took over like entire floors of Rockefeller Center, basically, and sort of brought up the American intelligence community as a sort of child of the British intelligence community. (laughs) And so there's like the sort of the deep kind of social connections there that kind of make that a kind of gradual baton transfer. I mean, if you go back to the 19th century, Americans have this thing called the Monroe Doctrine. You might have heard Mm. of it. And in some ways, the international community, as we call it, is our extension of the Monroe Doctrine to the entire planet. Mm. In that, basically, we're like, we don't recognize any regime that we don't support. The meaning of diplomatic recognition itself changed in, like many things in the 20th century. And if you go back, Americans don't like to hear this, but the Monroe Doctrine is actually a piece of British foreign policy. Yeah. It was basically, it was written by John Quincy Adams, I believe, but it was at the inspiration of Canning. Mm. And the whole idea of Canning, who, what was his line? I brought the new world into... It was showing up my I, I called the new world into existence to something. But basically, the British foreign policy that was... Britain essentially enforced the Monroe Doctrine, and the whole idea of the Monroe Doctrine as a piece of British foreign policy was that basically Spain was not going to get its empire back, and the Holy Alliance was not going to have a presence Mm. in the Americas. And in particular, what this meant is that British trading interests had a free hand across the Americas, which, of course, the Spanish had been at great pains to prevent. This is why soccer, or football, as I believe you call it, Mm. uh, is the national sport of Argentina, because Buenos Aires became this basically almost British colony in South America. Yes. So you had this policy that was nominally American, but the Americans were very much the satellite state is putting a little strongly, but they were very much the junior partner in that relationship. And then you sort of fast forward to the late 19th century, and you have this Venezuela dispute mm. in which the U.S. for the first time is like, no, we're going to enforce the Monroe Doctrine against you, the British Empire. Yeah. And the Brits are like, what? Yeah. You know, and then they're like... I believe Lord Salisbury went to his grave, like, thinking, they're like, maybe we should have intervened in the Civil War. (laughs) (laughs) By then it was a little late, old chap, you know, and and so you have this World War I existence there where from the start of World War I, American industrial and, like, productive power and financial power is very much on the side of the Allies, you know, the sort of the Morgan interests are kind of dragging us into the war. Mm. And because of, you know, these enormous loans that are being made. And at the end of the war, suddenly there's like, for the first time, there's this, just because of the financial disparities that have been created, suddenly Britain is maybe a little bit bankrupt. Yeah. You know, and... That gives the Americans... Not quite as bankrupt as today, but... but. Not quite as bankrupt as today. And there's this interesting piece that really bears this out that I found, and I still, like, this is the only place that I've seen this source, so I'm a little hesitant to trust it. But it's in a biography of Woodrow Wilson written by Herbert Hoover. Hmm. Most people don't know this exists. And Hoover recounts this interesting incident in the Wilson administration. Wilson is on his way home on an American liner 
the George Washington, I think. And after, you know, his trip to Europe, Versailles, he's like, you know, fitted everywhere. You know, everybody renames their streets after him, et cetera, et cetera. He's the hero of the new world, come to create peace in the old world, you know, and then he's heading home. And there's this interesting interaction he has where actually the U.S. ambassador to Russia is returning home at that time for health reasons. And the U.S. ambassador to Russia, basically Russia, of course, is like, you know, exploding at this time. And you have this strange situation where the U.S. ambassador to Russia is kind of the ambassador to like Kerensky. And then you have the Red Cross mission to Russia, which is our relationship with the Bolsheviks. And if you read the 14 points, I believe like 0.7 or something is like basically hands off the Bolsheviks because the Bolsheviks have a lot of American friends from day one. And Wilson basically from the George Washington sends this cable to London and Paris where he's like, hey, guys, I'm having a bit of a problem here because I hear that you guys are supporting these people, the whites in Russia. And these are bad people. These are reactionaries. They're monarchists. They want to restore the old regime. And, like, I can't really figure out why you're supporting them. And what's really disturbing is that, I hate to bring this up, but... You guys owe us a lot of money. And, you know, the, the, the thing is that if American public opinion was to find out that instead of paying us back, you're supporting these reactionaries in Russia, which was not, you know, popular, like, I'm just not sure how public opinion would react to that. Yes. So you might want to think again. And so basically the extent to which, you know, sort of people recall that America intervened in the Russian Revolution. Mm. And they sort of nominally intervened against the Bolsheviks. Mm. What they were actually doing is sandbagging the effort against the Bolsheviks. So they like send forces there and then the forces basically kind of don't want to do anything and kind of want to retreat and want to lose. And what they're trying to do is prevent basically right-wing militarist interests, you know, the last of the imperialists in Britain and France Mm. from supporting Denikin and, you know, the white armies, basically. And so the extent to which the U.S. basically creates the specter of Bolshevism that is sort of the, like, last, you know, destroyer of old Europe is really quite considerable, well, there were very interesting things that happened, you know, in, in the, sort of the early days of the revolution but between America and Russia. Mm-hmm. And I think baseball took off briefly. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, and no. Then, I mean, and then Ford, I think, launched a plant. In, oh, oh, yeah, no, I mean, there was a huge amount of, I mean, it's, it's FDR who finally recognizes the Soviets. But the love affair between, you know, the most fashionable people in America and the Bolsheviks, yeah. like starts right away. You have like John Reed, for example. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the only only American buried in the wall, of the Kremlin. Yes. And from like day one, it's like the way I try to explain this relationship is like, imagine you're a libertarian. Imagine you're a libertarian. And you're like, Honduras has been taken over by libertarians and they're creating the libertarian paradise. And you yeah. get all this like libertarian reporting from Honduras. There's like a the seastead. Yeah, you know, the seastead sea rising yeah. off the coast, right? You know, everything is happening, right? And then, you know, some asshole prints some story, oh, they're killing all the Indians, right? Yeah, you, know, <laughs> you know, this is just propaganda. Right, you know, and and, and this is the way You know, my grandparents were American communists and they were Jewish American communists. And this is the way they reacted. They're like, this is the promised land. Mm -hmm. And the hatred of the Russian regime all across the West, but especially in America, had been like so considerable. Like I have this book that I found by actually one of the founders of Slavic studies in the U.S. I'm forgetting the name offhand. He was funded by the Rockefellers to basically go and essentially raise revolution in Russia. And there's this one episode where she's talking to some like rich old Jewish lady in Chicago and she's like writes him a check and she's like, I hope this check buys the bomb that kills the czar. (laughs) (laughs) 
And so that's kind of the early days of like U.S. like revolutionary foreign policy. And like, you know, nowadays we have the color revolutions, right? Yeah. But it's kind of the same well, thing. I mean, that's what I wanted to ask you about is foreign policy is that has America ever been able to drop its revolutionary foreign policy? Excellent, excellent question. Well, I think the closest answer in some ways, I was just talking about this with someone at lunch, and when you look at the golden age of American imperialism in like the 1890s and the Spanish-American War, which is kind of the apex of like classic American imperialism, and it's very much taking taking a tip from the English in terms of their like kind of ideological method because basically they're like, oh, human rights are being violated in Cuba. Cuban maidens are being, you know, like violated, you know, by the brutal Spanish, you know, occupiers, right? And they sort of, all of this like yellow journalism is like ginned up, you know, and then of course the main blows up. Nobody knows why the main blows up in Havana. It's probably just carelessness you know <laughs> but then they're like aha spanish an evil spanish plot by the evil <laughs> king of spain right you know terrorism and, terrorism exactly yeah. like so the global war of, and on terrorism is like wow to win the global war on terrorism we must take cuba and the philippines mm -hmm. and the thing is that it's predatory okay like the spanish american war is this very predatory thing but the thing about the sort of predation of it is it's like a very 19th century imperialist predation. And so it has a sort of feeling of something that's like natural and right. Like Spain is the old weak deer, right? You know, the young wolf has got to, to preserve the ecosystem, the wolf has got to eat the deer. And, you know, the wolf takes the deer and he really eats the deer. And the U.S. really governs Cuba and the Philippines and like develops them and does like all the classic imperialist, you know, little brown brother, half devil and half child thing, yeah. you know, yeah. it goes full Kipling, right? You know, <laughs> and so, you know, from the sort of liberal premise, like America really goes full Kipling with its like imperial governance of these captured territories. And that's sort of like the high point in a sense, because you have this sort of bloodlust there, but then the animal actually eats mm. and the carcass is devoured and it's tasty and it's productive. And as time goes on, like the flow of American imperialism becomes more like a, a dog killing sheep for fun. And so <laughs> the sort of the thing that sticks in my memory, my historical memory about that is I was reading an interview with a Belgian in the Congo from the late 50s. And most people don't know, this has kind of been written out of history, but the Belgian Congo in the first half of the 20th century was like an enormous success. After Leopold, basically, like the Congo was having like regular, like 10% a year GDP growth. Like it was really, you know, along comes US foreign policy. And they're like, okay, Great job you've done, but now it's over. The wind of change is blowing. Mm -hmm. And the wind of change is blowing, and you must accept change because you must accept the future and the new way things are going to be. And the Belgians have to leave. Mm. It's just very clear. Like, otherwise, they, like, I mean, these are, like, all the levers that are used on Britain at Suez, right? And, you know, like, Eisenhower calls up Eden and, like, curses at him over the phone and is like, we will not sell you oil. What the hell are you doing? You know? And, um, you know, Suez is really the end of the British Empire. And so shortly, I believe it's shortly after that, that the Congo is basically taken from Belgium and given over to, like, ragged armies of cannibals mm. who basically slaughter and destroy and then eventually you have this insane UN war against Katanga you have the mercenaries you have Mad Mike Hoare like everything goes berserk right. in the Congo and is still nowhere near recovered from it right and so you know some reporters interviewing this like poor Belgian guy who like tried to build a world in the Congo and then has been like driven out by fire and the sword and this Belgian guy is like you know I understand why America would want to steal the Congo. The Congo is an amazing place. It's wonderful. Like, you know, of course you want it, right? What I don't understand is why they would want to steal it and then burn it down. 
So you have this sense of like the dog goes out and instead of killing one deer, instead of being a wolf and killing a deer and eating it, yeah. he goes and kills 20 sheep and then comes home for his dog food because he just likes the killing. And, you know, I had this, you know, to sort of fast forward, you know, from that into full out modernity. Six or seven years ago, I was at this venture capital event in San Francisco involving sort of a, a contest of young people. I don't want to be too specific here. And one of the, and they're like, they're like the semifinalists who we have to judge. And one of these, the poor guy who has to go first and giving his two minute presentation is named Abu something. And so he has to go first because alphabetical order and he's from Syria. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, he's like the best that Syria has to offer, right? But he's also like not going to win because he's like from Syria and his startup is like BS, right? Mm -hmm. And so I go and talk to this guy after the thing. And because I'm an asshole, I didn't talk at all about his like technology thing. I was just like, you know, tell me about the civil war in Syria. And by the way, which side are you on? Um, and and he's like, you know, I'm not really, I don't really have a side. I just don't want a, a civil war in my country. That means he's on the government side. And, um, and I'm like, do you know why the State Department started a civil war in your country? And, you know, in the Arab world, of course, they're very into conspiracy theories. Everything is like a four cushion pool shot and you're like well because they want to write the pipeline like this and i'm like yeah no do you know why the state department started a civil war in your country because it could because yeah. it could and and the thing is that you know the people at state who kicked off the arab spring who made that shit show happen i believe the last arab spring democracy that would be tunisia has now fallen back into dictatorship mm. after like two civil wars 500,000 people killed, something like that. And you remember how people were cheering at that time. Remember Google guy? Remember the Egyptian yeah. guy? He's like, oh, you know, the future is, you know, Egypt will be liberal and it will be governed by Google guy or someone approved by Google guy, right? <laughs> you know, and fortunately they managed to avoid a civil war. And they war. were building little networks. They were yeah, always building yeah. little networks. They were networks. always building, and they were using Twitter. Twitter it was yeah. a lovely time, freedom of speech, right? And, you know, the people who decided what actually happened there was that there was kind of a, a little bit of a change of the guard at state with the Obama administration. And you had these old guys who's like, well, you know, it's the Arab world. You have to be realistic, you know. And then these young guys come in, you know, they just graduated from Yale or whatever. And they're like, you're propping up dictators. <laughs> By propping up dictators, that's sort of American parlance for not overthrowing them when they should be overthrown. <laughs> and, you know, the thing about U.S. foreign policy is so they basically, you know, the young guys win. And so they tried out Obama and he comes out and says things like Mubarak must go. You yeah. know, Assad must go. Right. You know, as if well, he's there was like, a red line phase, wasn't it? There? there was a. You know, yeah, you're crossing this red line. Yeah, of course. But yeah. the thing is, you're forced to cross the red line anyway, right? This was yeah. with Gaddafi, right? You know, where it's like, oh, you have to tolerate this rebellion. You can't yeah. do anything about the rebellion. <laughs> and Gaddafi is like, we will exterminate the rats. You know, <laughs> and he gives this rat speech, yeah. which is great, right? And you have basically what that causes, you know, the victory of these young guys causes, you know, civil wars in two countries. It causes Egypt to almost get to civil war before they have to reverse and have their military dictatorship back and probably causes the death of about half a million people mm. and has no positive effect whatsoever. And the thing is, if you were at state and you were involved in the Arab Spring, despite it being an utter debacle, that is excellent for your career because you mattered. Yes. You made an impact. You did something. Okay, it didn't work, but that's not your fault. You no. know, and and so You saw a bit of action. You saw a bit of action. In a way, a military. Yeah, man yeah, might yeah. Be. You saw yeah. a bit of action, right? You know, that's sort of the way Afghanistan was maintained by DOD as like a live fire training training <laughs> range for twenty years. Right? You know, and so it's actually this this incredibly brutal and cynical thing when you basically you're just like why did we start a civil war in our in your country? You know, yeah. because we could. You know, it's like the scorpion and the frog. It's like it's my nature, right? And so, you know, this excitement and the excitement of like you must remember how well, not just Americans in the UK too, just the intoxicating champagne like feeling of like being behind a revolution in someone else's country. Yeah, it's just like when everyone. You, when you were talking about rats, you reminded me of David Cameron gave. Possibly the most cringe speech I've ever heard. Tell me. 
where he went to Libya and he said, you know, Gaddafi called you rats, but you didn't fight like rats, you fought like lions. <laughs> And even the even the Libyan crowd were like, oh, that's, that's pathetic. <laughs> you could do better than that, surely. <laughs> right, and it's so it's so cringe that it basically, of course, you know, Cameron is trying to sound Churchillian when yeah. he's doing that. But you know, all he's doing is sort of like making you think, well, maybe Churchill was a bit cringe as well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, when sort of this is kind of the reductio ad absurdum yeah. of all of this kind of revolution spreading of the last, you know, it's like if you go back to the 19th century and like Garibaldi and, you know, Garibaldi and Mazzini, you know, just they were exiles in England, you know, they had huge fan bases. They were like, you know, Gladstone goes and describes the what he's described the kingdom of the two Sicilies as something like he's like the last vestige of barbarism or whatever. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I forget the exact terminology. Gladstone, as a liberal, is very, yeah. very unhappy with the Bourbons. And then, you know, Garibaldi with his 300 men, like it's Garibaldi with his 300 red shirts and cruising right offshore as yeah. the Royal Navy. Yeah. Right. And so this is an exercise of British power and it's very like the exercise of American power that creates the American Philippines and American Cuba where you're just like we've taken this backward thing and we've made a nice modern British you know client state for our merchants to like play mm. and make money on right and so you know did that was that the unification of Italy good for Italy bad for Italy I don't know it happened and again, it resulted in sort of something workable. The example from that century that I always like to remind people of as a cautionary tale is that all of this liberation stuff and all of this nationalism, this is good national, good Italian nationalism is Mazzini, bad Italian nationalism, Mussolini, mm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And the good somehow always results in a British client state. It's very yeah. peculiar, you know? <laughs> and it's like they can sense that you and Britain are good, you know? <laughs> they, can, they can feel your goodness from afar, yeah. you know? And, yeah. and Poland was very inspired by this. And Poland, the Poles, of course, were... Um, part of Russia at that time, and they tried, I believe, three times in the 19th century to revolt against the evil Russian Tsar, you know, and they forgot just one very small basic issue, basically, which is that they didn't have a coastline. Yeah. <laughs> and, but they're still inspired by the propaganda, but the Royal Navy can't do anything because you don't have a coastline, yeah. right? <laughs> and And... That sort of 19th century, like, liberal imperialism where it's just like, okay, you can see it as this kind of cynical, brutal thing, but it also, it pays the bills, it gets shit done, and these same kind of diplomatic establishments that were kind of getting shit done for British and American commerce back in the 19th century are now like the dog-killing sheep. They're just doing it because that's what it does. 